In this video, I'm going to be guiding you on how to interpret diagrams for the multiple choice questions for paper 1. The diagram shows a country's production possibility curve. Which current combination of capital and consumer goods would produce the greatest number of consumer goods in the future? This is a bit of a trick question because it wants you to pick A, O, Q, which gives you 100% allocation for consumer goods. But remember, the question is saying number of consumer goods in the future, and this requires capital goods in order to make, as allocating 100% to capital goods today will be able to make the greatest number of consumer goods tomorrow. The diagram shows a production possibility curve and a number of output combinations for tea and coffee. Which combinations of tea and coffee would the economy currently produce? In this curve here, we know that any dot outside of the curve is unproducible. So in this case, W and Z. So the remaining letters U, V, X, Y are producible. Therefore, the answer is B. A country's infrastructure was damaged by a natural disaster. Before the disaster, the country was producing at point Y on the production possibility curve. Which point represents the country's production immediately after the disaster? The disaster represents a loss in potential output of an economy. This does not represent opportunity cost, so it's not A or B, so it must be D. The diagram show the supply curve of an individual grower of tomatoes and for the total market supply of tomatoes. What explains the similarities of the two curves? We know that the answer is not D as there is a positive correlation between price and quantity supplied. The answer isn't C as the profitability actually increases and we know it's not B because at lower prices each grower actually supplies less tomatoes. So. The answer is A. The diagram shows a demand curve. Which movement between points show a contraction in demand? The question is asking for a movement between points and a contraction. In this case, the answer is A, which is K to J, as there is a movement along the demand curve from K to J. M to K would be correct too, but there is no such option. The diagram shows a demand curve. What does the movement from X to Y show? The answer is not D, as the quantity demanded decreases from Q1 to Q2. The answer is not C or B, because there is no shift in demand in either way. So the answer is clearly A, as there is a decrease in quantity demanded with an increase in price. The diagram shows the supply curve of a good. The diagram shows the supply curve for a good. What is the name and cause of the movement of X to Y? We know that it is not A or B, as X to Y is an extension. We know it's not C, as an extension of the supply is definitely not caused by a decrease in demand, as the result of this will cause it to contract, so the answer is clearly D, an extension of supply caused by an increase in demand. The diagram shows the market for oil. The original equilibrium is X. Oil producers discover a new source of oil, while there is economic growth. What is the new equilibrium? There are two pieces of information which is very important in this question. The first is the discovery of new source of oil, and the second is that there is economic growth. Firstly, discovering a new source of oil means that the supply of oil will shift to the right from S1 to S3. And because there's economic growth, the demand for all goods and services will increase from D1 to D3. So this gives us the answer, C. The shoppers in the country become worried about a sudden and dangerous rise in air pollution and so they buy more food in case they have to stay at home. As the air pollution spreads, supermarket staff fall ill and the supermarkets struggle to keep their shelves 
full of food. X was the initial equilibrium in the market for food in supermarkets. What will be the new equilibrium as a result of the above situation? We've got two things going on here. Firstly, we've got people buying more food. And secondly, we have supermarket staff falling ill, so they struggle to keep their shelves full. So due to the sudden and dangerous rise in air pollution, people go and buy more food, meaning demand for food increases from D1 to D2 to this point here. But as supermarkets struggle to keep their shelves full due to ill staff, supply shifts to the left from S1 to S3. So we land at A. So the answer is A. The diagram shows market demand and supply curves. To what extent is the market in disequilibrium at the price P3? Suppliers are willing and able to supply at Q3 at the price of P3, indicated here. Consumers, on the other hand, are willing to demand goods and services at Q5 at the price of P3. So the market disequilibrium is the difference between Q5 and Q3. The answer to this question is D. The diagram shows two curves. One is the demand for labour, the other is the supply of labour. A government fixes a minimum wage that must be paid by employers. What will be the effect of this minimum wage? As you can see here, this is somewhat of a trick question. I'm going to give you an arbitrary number, which is $15 per hour is the current wage. But if the government hypothetically introduces a national minimum wage at $10 an hour, this will make no difference because you are receiving $15 an hour anyway. So the answer to this question is B. There's no change in the market equilibrium. In the diagram, D1 and S1 represent the demand for and the supply of labour. W indicates a legal minimum wage. An influx of immigrant labour causes the supply curve for labour to shift from S1 to S2. How many people will be employed if the minimum wage legislation is then abolished? Two things going on here. So firstly, let's abolish the minimum wage altogether. So this line now does not exist. Secondly, it tells us that due to immigrant labour, supply shifts from S1 to S2. So finding our new equilibrium now, the supply of labour is 7 million people. So the answer is D, 7 million. The diagram shows the wage rates of cleaners and nurses. What is the result of a national minimum wage of OM is introduced? In the case for cleaners, you can see that the minimum wage is higher than the equilibrium wage. And in the case for nurses, the minimum wage is lower than the equilibrium wage, meaning that there will be no change. Quick recap, for cleaners, the wage benefits them, so therefore their wages rise, and for nurses, there will be no change. So the answer here is D. The diagram shows a market for labour. X is the original equilibrium. A trade union negotiates a minimum wage at W and the government restricts the supply of immigrant labour. What is the new equilibrium? Restricting immigrant labour from S1 to S2. This results in the supply of labour to contract from S1 to S2, meaning now the wage rate is higher than the minimum wage so the minimum wage will have no effect. The answer is B. The diagram shows the imposition of a tax of UZ on a good. Which area shows the government tax revenue? Firstly, we need to understand that point V is the old equilibrium without tax. And due to the cost per unit increases, the supply decreases from S to S plus tax. And as there is less supply in the market, there is a movement along the demand curve from E to U. This will lead to consumers paying the price of T. And remember, the distance between S and ST is the tax, which results in firms only receiving 
at y. Now we know that consumers are paying t and firms are receiving y and we know that the tax is the distance between s and st. This means that this box here must be the tax revenue. So the answer here is d. The diagram shows the impact of a tax introduced on a product. Which area represents the amount of tax paid by the consumer? Similar to the diagram before, P1 equals Q1 is the equilibrium. As the government introduces a tax, supply will shift backwards or to the left from S1 to S2. This causes a movement along the demand curve from the equilibrium to point E. As a result, the consumers will pay the price of P2. As discussed before, the distance between S1 and S2 is equal to the government tax, illustrated by the red line from E to G. And here we can find out that the firms will receive the revenue of H. So to illustrate the consumer burden and the producer burden, we know that the consumers used to pay P1, but now they are paying P2. As the quantity demanded has contracted from Q1 to Q2, therefore the consumer burden of tax is this top box here. On the other hand, firms used to receive revenues from P1 and now they receive H. And as quantity demanded has fallen from Q1 to Q2, this box here would represent the producer tax burden as revenue lost due to the tax. And some of you might be asking, what is this triangle over here? This is what we call the welfare loss. You don't need to know this in IGCSE. So long story short, what is the answer? It is D. The diagram shows the imposition of a subsidy on the product supplied by a firm. Which area represents the total revenue of the firm, including the subsidy? The question is asking for total revenue. This is price multiplied by quantity. The total revenue without the subsidy would be F multiplied by L. And the revenue with the subsidy would be G multiplied by M. So this gives us the answer of O, G, H, M, which is D. In an African country with large areas of tropical desert, the price elasticity of demand for salt is highly inelastic. This will result in greater consumer expenditure on salt when price changes from P1 to P2. Which diagram illustrates this situation? Well, the scenario here gives it away. It says that salt is highly inelastic and we know that a highly inelastic demand curve is very steep. This gives us the answer D. In the diagram, which line represents perfectly inelastic supply? This is a straight line, so it's B. The diagram shows the supply curve for a good. Which is the price elasticity of supply when the price rises from $2 to $4? The formula to finding this is the percentage change in quantity demanded divided by the percentage change in price. Doing a calculation on the percentage change in quantity demanded. This is the difference between the quantity, which is 10, as this is the difference between 20 and 30 units, divided by the original, which is 20. This gives us 0 0.5. And if we calculate the percentage change in price, which is the change in price, which is $4 and $2, which is 2, over the original, which is 2, this gives us the value of 1. And now we have percentage changes for both quantity and price. We just need to divide them together, which is 0 0.5 over 1. And the answer is 0 0.5 B. The diagram shows a market for rice that is in equilibrium. Which area represents the total revenue for rice farmers? As we know, the calculation for total revenue is price multiplied by quantity. So that means V multiplied by Y is the total revenue. So the total revenue is this box here.
which are the letters O, V, X, Y, which is B. The diagram shows a firm's total cost curve. What is the average variable cost if the firm produces an output of O, Q? The calculation for average variable cost is the total variable cost divided by the total output. Don't forget that the distance between O and W are reserved for fixed costs. Hence why the total cost line starts there. And this means that the distance between W and X is for the variable costs. And so using our calculation before, total variable costs, which is WX, divided by the total output, which is OQ. So the answer is C. The diagram shows the cost of a firm. What is the firm's total variable cost at an output of 100 units? Now firstly, we know that this line is the total cost as it starts at the fixed costs. And this line is the total variable cost as it starts from zero, as if you are making zero output, your variable cost will be zero. So at the output of 100, we can trace up to the total variable costs and we get $50,000. So in this case, D is the answer. The diagram shows the total revenue and total cost of a firm in a market. At which level of output will the firm be maximizing its profits? So at point A, we've got total revenue equals total cost, which means they're not making a loss or a profit. Same with point C, where total revenue also equals total cost. At point D, this indicates that total cost is greater than total revenue, indicating a loss. And for point B, total revenues exceed total cost, meaning they have maximized their profits. So the answer is B. A firm has increased output from Q1 to Q2 and achieved economies of scale. How is this shown on the firm's average cost curve, ATC? As firms grow in size, average total cost will decrease due to economies of scale, such as managerial, financial, technical, etc, etc. But if the firm grows too large in size, it will experience what we call diseconomies of scale. This is due to a breakdown of communication and bureaucracy. So the answer here is A, because as you can see, as output increases from Q1 to Q2, the average cost will decrease from C1 to C2. The diagram shows the average total cost for a firm in the long run. What could cause the shift from ATC1 to ATC2? This means that there will be lower costs at every level of output. It is not C or D as we are not moving along the average total cost curve. As C and D only work when output increases, the average cost of production will decrease. It's not A because it doesn't make sense, which leaves us with B. As external economies of scale is able to provide with additional infrastructure and education system over the long run, average total costs will decrease at every level of output. The diagram shows total costs, fixed costs and total variable costs, which costs are shown by W, X and Y. Y represents fixed costs, as when output increases, the cost of this does not. X represents total variable costs as it starts from zero. So if you are making zero products, your variable cost will be zero. And W is total cost as it starts at fixed cost, which means it is the sum of X and Y. So the answer to this is B. The diagram shows the firm's total cost curve. What is the average variable cost if the firm produces 10 units of output? The calculation to this is the total variable cost divided by the output. To find the total variable cost, we need to discard first the fixed cost, which here is $10. So if we take the total cost, which is $50, minus the fixed cost, which is $10, that gives us $40. Then we divide that by the units of output, which is 10 units. This gives us the average variable cost of $4. So the answer is, Hey, I hope that helped. I hope you guys have a good day. Bye-bye.